tell a story together. All right. This is a story of how you found out just how special you were. You were in an abandoned house. Uh, now, you heard this house was dangerous, but you heard that it had treasure, and, you know, special people deserve treasure. Special people can handle danger. So there you were. You came into this abandoned house, and it was full of trash. There was a weird smell that hit you as soon as you got in. In the library, all the bookshelves were pulled down, and they just made a mess on the floor. But you're poking around. Maybe there's some valuable books for a special person like you. You uncover a long, dead body underneath the books in the bookshelf, mummified, sort of. And the body was wearing a red lounging robe of silk, and its skull was smashed in. There's movement in the corner, and you startle at first. Maybe you draw your dagger, maybe you raise your hand because you might know some magic. Maybe you've got a, a, a sword at your side, a rusty old sword, when that movement startles you. But you discover it's just some rabbits. Looks like a mother rabbit and her kits nesting in the corner of this abandoned house. Oh, okay. So you start looking under the piles of books. You find a locked chest. Ah, a treasure chest underneath those books. It's got a rusty lock, which is good because you really don't know how to lock pick yet all that well. And you can smash that lock open and you can open it up inside. Inside, the smell hits you, and then you see there's a huge dead rat inside the chest. But next to the rat, there are three stoppered bottles, and they are so clean. They're like brand new, made just for you, despite all the hair and shit inside that box. These things have been untouched by age. That's a good sign. And next to that is a jeweled dagger, also shiny and new. The rat twitches. It opens its dead eyes, little red pinpricks where its eyes should be, its rotten face. It looks up at you and goes, <sighs> and the smell of death hits you. You take maybe a step back. That rat jumps out, sniffs the air, and starts heading right for those rabbits. So what did you do next? What did you do? Only you know what happened in that house. What did you do first? Did you grab one of the bottles? Did you grab that dagger? Did you shield those rabbits? Did you destroy that rat? Or did you try to command the rat to make it your own? What did you do? So, there are three major elements in D&D. And the first one, oops, is the world. So listen to this world that you're in. I made this world. Some of it's borrowed, some of it's new. It starts off as a story like any other, but don't worry, you'll be able to make more decisions pretty soon. You are all in your own little groups, which I'll talk about later. Imagine you in a, in a carriage with several other people, most of them sitting at your table. And this carriage is headed east to a place called Timberway Valley. Timberway Valley uh, is a wild frontier. There's farms among ancient ruins, crumbling ruins long since abandoned. You know you need to get over a very cold and dangerous pass over the snowy pass east into this, uh, into this, uh, this, this uh, valley. Dangerous there. So you've got horses drawing the carriage. You've got a driver. You've got a couple guards. This cost just about all the money you had to make this new start. Now the carriage starts at a city called Neverwinter. Neverwinter's on the coast, it's a big city. A cliff splits it down the middle, sort of carves it into two. There's a high, rich part and a low, very poor part. It's kind of hard to scale that cliff to get from one to the other. So maybe you, personally, you, your character that you've got on that sheet in front of you, maybe you got on the carriage there where it started in Neverwinter. Why was that? Maybe you had some gang trouble? Maybe you were just sick of the city and you wanted to get out to the wilderness. Maybe you worked in a shop and you saw somebody selling some amazing treasure and you heard that it came from Timberway Valley. Maybe this is where you came on and maybe you had that one of those reasons to do so. That carriage, it followed a road kind of north, northeast. 
It goes towards a snowy mountain range and it gets bigger and bigger as the hours roll by. You go through farmland and villages. And maybe this is where you got on as the carriage stops in this beautiful place. Maybe this is where your character has been waiting for the carriage. Maybe you got on this carriage because you want to start your own farm. You know, there's cheap, abundant land out in Timberway Valley. You know, you fought wolves. You fought some giant rats. Like I said, you're special. You've always been special. You've always had this ability to bounce back from adversity and learn quickly and recover from damage. So you think, I could do some fighting in order to get some free land. So maybe you're going from one place to the other. Maybe you got that taste for more combat. But maybe you just have a terrible family that you just can't stand and you need to get away from. It's like, fine, I'm going to Timberway Valley. Slam that door, get on the carriage, and off you go. Maybe that's the start of your character's story. You decide this for yourself. That carriage it skirts around Lake Nen, a giant bucolic lake surrounded by forest. A lot of elves live here. Now, the city had pretty much every type of person, you know, every type of race, as they call it, which is basically like a species, you know, just different humanoids of sort of different sort of alien species, you can imagine. And the city has every single kind. But in Lake Nen, this is where a lot of elves are living, as elves naturally did for millennia before cities even came to this land. So they're in tree houses, like actual tree houses, and they're living naturally there. You see halflings, people who are about half as tall. You might call them hobbits, apart from you know, copyright problems. Uh, and they are in hobbit holes, which is not related to the copyright problem I just related to. Maybe you got on here amongst the elves and hobbits. Maybe you are yourself one of those or even living among them. And maybe those adventures on the lake is what did it. Because you know there's something called the sea. The sea is over the, uh, the ridge. And if you keep going east through Timberway Valley, it ends in water that is so big you cannot see the other side. So maybe that lake made you long for something bigger like the sea. You know that your people, you know, you know that, that you're supposed to thrive in wild lands. You're too close to a city. Maybe you want to get away from civilization, far from that big city. Maybe you had a religious experience. As I'll explain later, the deities are very real. Maybe they're just very powerful adventurers, but they're definitely out there, and they definitely will talk to you once in a while. Maybe you had a religious experience calling you to Timberway Valley. Maybe this is where your adventure started. You get to decide this for yourself. That carriage, it goes up a mountain road through some switchbacks. It heads east over a bridge. This giant waterfall, stunning. It's the uh, Nentir River that flows out from this waterfall and eventually goes way down. You're so high up that you can look down and see Lake Nen, just like a tea saucer. It's so small. This river feeds into that. Neverwinter is just this smoky mass off on the horizon. You're so high up and so far away. So you, as passengers, you know, this whole carriage will take a few days. I won't describe what happens day to day, but you definitely spend the night here. It's a place called Falling Water Inn. It's exactly positioned for you know, people like you to stay in before the really dangerous part of, the, of the, the trip happens. So maybe this is where you've been waiting to get on that carriage. There's lots of dwarves here. Again, every type of person comes from here, but dwarves are especially numerous here. Maybe they're taking a break from mining in the mountains, which is a favorite dwarven activity. There's one really muscular dwarf with a red fur cloak and a huge battle axe singing and leading everybody in this battle song as everybody gets drunk. Maybe you get drunk. That's also your decision as well. All right. So imagining this world, that's part of the magic of D&D. &D. Um, I want you to try to see these things in your mind as I describe them. And you make up your part of this story, where you got on and why. Uh, you decide your own backstory, as they call it, as a character. So we'll do a little show of hands, you know, no, no pressure, and you can change your mind later on, but you might have had an inkling. Who here thinks that their character got on at that big city Neverwinter? Raise your hand now if you think you got on from the big city of Neverwinter. Go ahead, raise your hand if you feel that that's your character's origin. Now, everybody, look around at other people's hands are up. If your hand is up, look at other people's hands are up, because maybe you know each other. If you're at the same table, you might know each other, but you might bump into each other later on. So. Put your hands down. Yeah, maybe you're related. Maybe you're enemies. But maybe you, both, you definitely both came from that big city and got on the same carriage. All right. Who here uh, thinks they got on uh, in that, that wooded area or Lake Nen, out in the forest, in those farms and things? So raise your hand if you came from a farm, just an ordinary farm community. Raise your hand if you're a farmer. Look around. Okay, look around other people with their hands up. So you, you know, farming communities are small. You might know them. You might, again, be related, be friends, be enemies. You might have a story together that way. 
who came from Lake Nen amongst all those elves and hobbits and, uh, and things like that? Raise your hand if you came from Lake Nen, really in that sort of wild old country. Good, again, look around, see if there's somebody who's in common with you. Last thing, who here got on at Falling Water Inn? that big inn up in the mountains where all the dwarves and all the singing and the drinking was going on. There's survival towns, you know, there's independent people. Raise your hand high because you're proud to live out in the wilds. Look around. See if anybody else has got their hand up. Remember them. You might know them. All right. So you came from different places and now you're unified on this dangerous journey. You and several other people in this carriage. You take off from the Falling Water Inn. It's bitter cold this morning. The driver's name is Vistra, flamboyantly dressed in a purple gown, vivid makeup, very high hair, and she loves to spout verse, considers herself a poet. Uh, there's two guards with spears and bows. There's both cousins to each other, you learn. Um, and uh, I'm just going to roll randomly to see. Oh, they are dwarves themselves. All right, all right. And how old are they? Uh, they're they're middle aged. They've been around for a while. You know, they're 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 middle aged adults, so they seem pretty experienced. They've got spears and bows. One of them is stocky with a really strong jaw and stubble, and wearing heavy green gloves. The other one is thin, bright eyed, with shiny lips, uh, with a long hair braid. They look ahead to the road. They're sort of wary. Uh, they and you remember how dangerous this journey is going to be. So, we get to the second element of D&D. &D, and that is choice. You and you, uh, w w the choice is, uh, is what you choose as your character. I am the dungeon master, as they say. I make the world. I know everything in the world. But you make choices that I can't control. Um, the choices, as this arrow shows, change the world. You make an impact, a strong impact on the world, but the world then gives you more choices in reaction. So these two things play off each other, and neither of us is entirely in control already. I control the world and you control your choices, so already things are getting a little hairy. That's the great thing about D&D, your choices. So let's talk about a choice that you're about to make. So you're climbing uphill on this carriage. It is a uh, really cold, early, dark morning. I want you to try to smell it, try to see it, try to feel that cold in your bones while you're in this carriage. Now, as you're riding uphill to the left, which is even further uphill, you see some caves. And the bright-eyed guard uh, peers out and says quickly, put out the lanterns. And Vistra says, ah, yes, the morning lord has us well in his arms. Save the oil to slip from the grip of night, Vistra says. But the stocky guard growls, has none of it, and says, we may lose more than oil. Sturges are coming this way. Sturges. Hmm. These things are about the size, you know, of a, of a cat. Uh, sort of halfway between a mosquito and a bat with a very long, sharp snout. And they swarm out, seeking warmth and light. They're attracted by the light and heat on this very cold morning, and you are that source in this carriage. They swarm out from that cave. The guards, they shout, close the windows! But you all are a bit slow, it's cold, the windows aren't really built, you know, for the money you pay for this carriage, maybe you should wish for some better safety features because some of the windows are kind of stuck open. These things fly in through a couple of the windows and attack you inside the carriage. They grab one of your back with its claws and it sticks its nose just deep into your neck and starts to suck your blood out like a giant mosquito. So, everyone should have a rope in front of you and you're going to pair yourself with the person across from you, whoever's sitting across from you on the table. Now, if we have an odd person here, one of our volunteers will come over and play with you. We have one person left out here. Do we have any other odd people out? Could you temporarily, could you temporarily come to the odd person? If, if, you're, if you're shy, uh, why, why don't you go on to the, uh, oh wait, no, this is the no video table. So if, if you got an odd at person out, Mark, is there an odd person out? Yeah. Do you mind just for, just for one minute, just come here and pair up with this person here? Thank you. So, you've got the rope and you're facing the person across from you. All right. So, one of the pair of you just grab the rope, okay? So you, there's people facing each other. One of you now has full possession of the rope. 
Just one of you has full possession of the rope. You have the two ends in your hands. And what you do, like in number one here, is you know, maybe under the table, swap those ends around and hold up your two fists so that the other person doesn't know whether you've got which has got the red and which has got the silver. Not that it matters. So you're facing across there, right? So hold up your two fists to the person across from you, right? Face them, right? Uh, so if you don't have the rope and you're facing that person across, pick one of their hands and take that end of the rope. So you end up like step four. One of you has got one end and one of you has got the other end. So volunteers, take a look around. Maybe do a little circulation to make sure everybody's got that. Hold up, uh, hold up. You can show the tape. You should, you should, the, the end should be visible now. The color is visible now. Good, yeah, see so you're all doing it. That's great. Okay, everybody good? All right. So we got a bit of randomness. You know, there's no dice yet, but we've already got a bit of a random event on who got which end. All right. Okay. So everyone's all set. Volunteers, everybody look good? All right, thank you. Okay. Now make sure uh, you know, we do have some sanitizer. You might have your own sanitizer. We have some bottles on the table. You can get up and get sanitizer if you want. It's just try not to touch your eyeball, you know, if, if you've been touching this rope. Make sure you sanitize after the end. Everybody's set. Okay, great. All right. So I'm going to show you how we do this. So we have a red end and a silver end, yeah? So sometimes I'll address those of you with the red end do X or the silver end do X. So of course you've got that. All right. So the red, of course, you know, just to be super obvious because we like to do absolute beginners here. I want to make sure not to leave anybody behind. If, if you're lost, raise your hand. One of the volunteers will help you. But you can see the person on the left has got a red end. I'm sorry if you're, if you're not color insensitive. Uh, I, I didn't think of this. I should do some texture changes. The person on the left has got red end. If you've got that red end, like the person on your left, the Sturge is stuck into your neck and is sucking blood. Now, those of you who have the silver end, right, this person on the right is the silver end. If you have the silver end, you are next to the person who has the Sturge sucking away at their neck, and you get to help if you want. Now, do you want to help them? Because <laughs> there's no sturge in your neck, you know, like oh, the, the windows are shut now, you think, or, you know, it seems like all the sturge are pretty much taken care of. That's no problem, you know. You don't have a sturge in your neck if you've got the silver end. And so this could be their, this could be a their problem problem, right? And to help, you need to grab this dangerous thing. It's got claws. It's, it's a lo a angry looking. It hurt you just as much as it hurts them. So you're taking a risk to help them out. But if you don't help them out, that person could end up quite badly hurt. So what are you going to do? Now, don't discuss it. Just look into the eyes of the other person. <laughs> Try to convince them with merely your face. <laughs> now, note, there's a difference in D&D. D&D <laughs> makes a distinction between you as a person and you as a character. All right? So your character might be an ideal person, you know? Maybe you feel like being a really good person. That's fine. Your character would be super good. But maybe you're a good person in real life. Maybe you want to be transgressive. Maybe you want to be selfish and mean and self-centered for a change. Maybe you want to get that side out of yourself, right? So you can transgress in the following decision. You can be the ideal, be the same, be opposite, have fun. Make a choice that excites you. Be good, be bad. This is how we explore. All right, so. The nature of the choice is such, I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. Don't do it yet. I'll ask you all to close your eyes, and then I'll ask you holding the silver end, so make sure you know whether you have the silver end or not. Once your eyes are closed, you know, memorize your end. If you have the silver end with everybody's eyes closed, you'll do one of two things when I say go. You will hold your thumb up, which means like, yes, I'm going to risk my life to help you, or you'll put your palm up like, not, I'm not going to help you, right? So don't signal what you're going to do, or, you know, you, you're probably lying if you're doing it right now. You're probably trying to fake them out. And then I'll tell you to open your eyes. Does everybody understand? Look at the end of the rope. Know if you're red or silver. Okay. If you're the silver end, you'll have to choose. Close your eyes, everybody. Silver enders, make your choice. Put your thumb up or your palm up. Keep your eyes closed, but put your thumb up or your palm up. Okay. Last chance to decide. And then everyone on three, open your eyes. One, two, three. <laughs> uh, I hear some variety in the room. I see, I see. Okay, we got some variety. That's good. <laughs> All right.
Now, you know, this this is a this is a D&D for what 60 people at once. So, you know, the choices are a little limited, but everyone will kind of split into two sort of groups. You'll knit back together again. I remember D&D has choices that radiate and radiate and radiate. It's only 5 of you at the table. So, this is just a taste of the kind of thing that can happen. So, we'll temporarily kind of tell two different stories here depending on what happened. If you have the silver end and your palm is up, right? You and your red partner, just wait a second. I'll get to you in a second. Okay. Don't do this next part. So, if you have the silver end and you put your thumb up, Here's what happens. You're going to save your buddy who's holding the red end. And here's what happens. In the carriage, you with the silver end, you get behind your buddy, you pull at that sturge, but the sturge are skidding around and evading. It digs its claws into you a bit, uh, you know, in its, in its panic and its desire to keep on drinking. It scratches you. You take some damage. Damage looks like this. So you see on your character sheet in front of you, now remember the very top sheet is the only one you need to look at. You should be looking at the very front of your character sheet. Ignore those other pages. Those are for later, not tonight. So you see that you have a hit point section on your sheet. At the top it says hit point maximum is printed. Now in pencil, write your current hit points, which is one less. Yes, there is some math in DD. So subtract one, right? So I see here somebody had a hit point maximum of 12. I just said you lost one hit point. So if you've got the red end, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, so, sorry, if you have the silver end and you put your thumb up, because you're going to help, you're the one taking this damage. Subtract one hit point, silver end people, with your, uh, facing a thumb up, with your thumb up. Okay. Write down your hit points. That's one less. All right. Again, raise your hand if you're totally confused. Your volunteers will help you out. All right. So below that, you got that down. You write that down. Minus one. Okay, cool. And you see on the right hand side, somebody has an eight hit point maximum and they're down to seven. So you can see that's a bit more worrying. All right. So you holding the other end, you are holding the red end and your partner put their thumb up. The Sturge did manage to suck some blood out of you before your buddy rescued you. So you also take one hit point of damage the same way. So you too, with the red end, subtract one hit point. Even though your buddy helped you, wasn't quite enough. With the pencil, write the new number just like you have here. All right, so all of you pairs that had a thumb up, you're done for now. Keep holding your rope. Uh, it doesn't matter too much. You know where, they, where each other are. Now, those of you who have a silver end with your palm up, this is what you decided to do. You decided to stay out of danger if you have the silver end with your palm up. So you step away like, nope, 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 nope. You back away from that situation. You take no damage. If you put your palm up in the silver end, you take no damage. You holding the red end, who is facing someone with their palm up, uh, it didn't go so well. The sturge, uh, its, its body was at an odd angle behind you. Uh, its claws are digging in. It takes a few tries to pull it out of your own body. You pull it out, but that sturge is fat. It drank deeply of your blood. You knock it down, you squish it, but you can see how much blood it spatters on the floor when you squash it. You, with that red end, if you were facing a palm up, you take three hit points of damage. Subtract three from your maximum. <laughs> All right. So you can see, look at your max, but this time just do that maximum minus three, right? Take that maximum minus three. Pencil that in. Everybody keep holding the rope. Okay. So. Sturges came in, some got pulled off, they all got pulled off, they got thrown on the floor, they got squashed, they got stomped on, it was all really gross, and that's done. Then you hear distant flapping from the direction of the cave. There's some latecomer Sturges that were sort of creeping up through the mist, staying low to the ground. These are kind of old, wily Sturges. They've maybe been this, done this thing before. And they were sneaky. They came in from the opposite side of the carriage and came through a not very well closed window. So please swap the ends of your rope, please. Swap the ends of your rope with your partner. The red one gets the silver end. The silver one gets the red end. So we're going to do this again. Different roles. Now, if you have the silver end, you know, if your partner you know, played safe and held up their palm when you got bit, now might be your time for revenge, understandable. But, you know, you might help anyway because, look, you know, you're, you all got to defend each other. There's less damage overall if you help out. So what are you going to do there? But if your partner helps you, of course, you could return the favor. You know, you'll take, you know you're going to take a little damage by returning the favor, by the way. But, you know, you could play safe because 
newsflash, there's definitely no more Sturges coming. This really is the end of it. So this could be your chance like, uh, sorry, I'm not gonna help you out after all. It's over after this. So again, think about yourself as a person versus as a character. You get mad, your characters can get mad at each other, but we have the magic circle here. Your, your people, you don't have to be mad at each other's people about your character choices. So I'm going to rewind a bit, but you might guess what happens next. You got a red end or a silver end? Okay, all right. Again, let's see, you can talk all you want, but it's only gonna matter once your eyes are closed, right? I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes. If you're holding the silver end, you'll do a thumb up or palm up, but everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes now. Now, if you have the silver end, put your thumb up or your palm up. Thumb up, I'm gonna help. Palm up, nah, I'm not gonna help and I'm gonna avoid damage. Everybody on three, open your eyes. One, two, three. <laughs> All right. Ah, so good. <laughs> simple choice, simple choice. So, you know the deal, but I'll go through a step at a time because we like to do that here, step at a time. So, if you have the silver end and your palm was up, you and your partner wait, don't do this next part. If you have the silver end and your thumb was up, you save your buddy holding the red end. Same thing happens. You lose a hit point and your buddy loses a hit point. Same thing, you pull the Sturge off, the Sturge scratches you up a bit, you each lose a hit point. If there's a thumb up between you, you each lose one hit point. You do the same thing again. You subtract yet another one. So I think I have a demonstration, yeah. So, thank you, Maria. So you see, now you cross off the old total and you put down your new, even lower total of your hit points as you go. Keep on tracking your damage. All right. Uh, now, you holding the other end with your partner's thumb up, yeah, yes, like I said, you took one hit, but pair damage. Okay, you pairs are done. Again, if you have a silver end with, and you're facing someone with your palm up, the one with the silver end has stayed out of danger. You step away, nope, nope, nope. You do not take any damage. The one with the red end, if you've been facing a palm up, you take three points of damage. Subtract three hit points from your total. I heard some groans out there, so I think a few people are doing that. If this is your first damage, of course, you know, just your maximum minus three. Again, raise your hand if you've got any problems. If we were at the table, I would stop play to explain things. This is like how step by step we go. Absolute beginners learning D&D, you've got to make sure that nobody gets left behind because things go on sort of one layer at a time, yeah? So we're going a little slow, but it's much better to not leave people behind. And it speeds up as we go. Okay. So. You can hold on to the ropes for a little bit more, but, uh, but since you're at tables, this next part is gonna be easy. Very good, all right. Now, it's fine if your character was selfish. It's fine if your character screwed over somebody else. That's part of D&D, &D, especially when the party starts. Now, you're eventually gonna be like a sports team. You are a cooperative team that's gonna be against the world, and you'll learn that cooperation becomes really your only choice. If you end up sniping at each other, things don't go so well. But, you know, it's okay to tell a story where when you first met, you're playing a character that's a bit uh, a bit selfish or transgressive or whatever else. That's great. Flaws are interesting. You know, like I said, maybe in real life you're so nice, you really want to be a mean character. That's great. That's a lot of fun. But even selfish characters sometimes, yeah, it's their best interest to go along with the group anyway because of the common enemies. And you can evolve. You can start off selfish, and that your character arc could be how you discover how to be good and trusting uh, to the others. Or the opposite. You might start off nice and just decide that the world has screwed you over too many times, you turn bad. Break bad, as it is. All right. Now, you've all got your sheets. You'll be holding this up, but it should be, again, easy because you're at tables. Because you'll notice that your table right next to you, if there's a little divider of the tables, you know, your groups of four, you have four different colored sheets on your table, yeah? You've got four different characters of different strengths. You are forming a team. So your table has these different sheets. If that's true, you can uh, ask, raise your hand if you've got any problems with that. But uh, you are now in a group. If you are mates that end up on different tables, it's okay to, to swap around. Anybody get split up from their mates? You definitely should be sitting at a table with your mate if you came. All good? Okay. So, uh, yeah, we, we would normally, just, just in case you know, if you're standing, I've done this with a stadium of like many, many people, like 80 people, and they don't have tables, and this is where they wind their ropes into an X to show that they're in a group together. It's kind of cool. But you can do that if you really are into it, but that's okay. You don't have to. All right. So, you're all merged up. You've got groups of four. Group of three is fine. So, you who, who sat over here, you can go back and sit with your mates because you just needed to pair up, and so you three are a group of three, and you can join your friends back there if you like. But if you love these people, you can stay there if you like. Okay. Ah, thank you. 
Yeah, that X that I was just talking about. Thank you, Maria. All right. So you four at the table, three or four, you are an adventuring party. And when you play D&D again, and I hope you do, whether it's with me or you'll learn enough that you'll want to start playing D&D at a beginner's table somewhere else, you'll generally have two to five players sitting around one table. And um, uh, I would sit at the table. I'd be the dungeon master. So I'm the one who kind of runs and organizes the game. And I have control of the world, like I said. Uh, you can drop the rope now. You can sanitize and all that stuff. You are now in a group. Congratulations. So I want you to pretend, hey, hey, all right. You can give yourself a nickname, you know, cool uniforms or logos or whatever else you like. All right. So again, to simulate what D&D is like, I want you to imagine, I want each of you to pretend that only you at the table is here. No other tables exist. It's just you four and me sitting at the same table, OK? Saying that to all of you. Pretend that that's sort of what D&D is going to be like, with many more choices, more complexity, but you get a taste. All right. Uh, so tonight I'm going to uh, DM for all of you at once, and we're getting going. All right, hope you're having fun, and it gets better as we go. Here we go. All right. So, third element we're going to introduce. What about those dice? All right. The third main pillar of D&D we're learning about is the dice. And no matter what your psychic friend says, nobody controls the dice. The dice do what they want. Uh, they give the story random twists. So what we make together, our job is to make a story together. This is not like a video game where I'm the computer and you're just trying to suck treasure and levels out of me. We are here to make a story together, and the best kind of story has unexpected twists. It's even more fun if I am surprised by it as well, because I can't control the dice as much as DMs like to think they will. So it, nobody's in control, and the story starts going in these random crazy directions, and that's where things get really fun. This is a magical combination. You see, they all bounce off each other because the world sometimes is changed by the dice. Sometimes I'll roll the die to see what the world is doing, and it's not your choice. Of course, your choice may involve rolling the die, and your choice may succeed or fail. And that success or failure either changes the world or changes your attitude about your next choice to make. So you see these things all bounce off each other in a chaotic system. All right. So all of you in the party with these different colored sheets, you all are good at different things. We call them chances to shine in various situations. So let's imagine uh, that the carriage has all of you, just you. So just the four of you at the table, you're in the carriage. And there's a couple of you know, what we call non-player characters. There are characters like you, but they're not adventurers. They're going to be much more delicate than you. They're much more easily damaged. They don't bounce back. Again, you've always been special. Imagine like when you're in high school or university, there's that one person who seemed to learn things fast and could play every sport. That's the kind of person that you've always been. Now you're amongst other people that are kind of special like you. But there's a couple other carriages that are not quite so special. Let's not say anything bad about them, but they are NPCs. OK, so they're not very adventurous. That means they are freaked out by this thing that happened with the Sturges. You know, maybe one of them is very badly sick. So one of them loses three hit points. They are looking very sick. They can't handle any more damage than that compared to you all. So. You're riding in that carriage. And you're climbing, as I said, through the snow. You're getting up in elevation. And you reach the summit. Whew, that's good. But it's so cold. There's snow on the ground. And horses are steaming you know, out of their noses, as happens in that, uh, in that cold day. It's about noon. The road has gotten narrower. And uh, that steep mountainside drops away at your right very steeply. And it just goes down and down and down towards uh, Neverwinter. <clears throat> you hear. <laughs> around a corner and then you see a giant baby I mean like a baby giant like 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 a giant had a baby L like a baby who's giant size that's who comes around the corner a giant baby all right this baby has a red sash around his waist and has got dead animals tied to it and it's he's a happy guy he sees you he uh, his eyes light up oh he comes over to play with you. Thump, 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 thump. He's taller than most of you. Thump, 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 thump. He grabs the carriage like it's his new toy, and he starts to rock it and push it back and forth. He obviously wants to push the carriage over. The problem is you are near a very steep hill. You will fall, it will roll, and bad things will happen. So it is time for a hero to emerge in the situation. We want to find out who is best in your party to push back against this baby. And let's find out who has a strength of plus three. 
On your character sheet, there's a row of six important numbers, big numbers on the left side. And the one with the th number three, like I show up on the screen, is probably the best one. Look at everybody else's sheet, but you'll probably see you're the strongest. If you have somebody who has the same color sheet, they might be tied. I don't think that'll happen. Okay. So again, if you haven't found out, if you're a noble human fighter with yellow sheets, yeah, you're the one with the plus three. All right. So you're the hero. You are stronger than the others. Again, raise your hand if you're confused. I'm not seeing too much confusion. It's hard to the masks, but I don't see too much confusion. All right. Take that 20-sided die and hold it up. All right. Now you at this table, if you don't mind rolling in the die tray, because we've got the camera on there. Everybody's going to be watching your roll. That's okay. They can't see your face, though, so they can't blame you. All right. So you hold out the 20-sided die because you're going to. Don't do it yet, but you will roll the die when the DM says so. You can blow on it. You can wish for it. Use your psychic abilities, whatever you think. All right. Now, any parties, if you don't have a noble human fighter, right? Maybe you have sheets that you have a table has no yellow sheet there. That's fine. Who has a strength of plus two? Somebody at your table probably has a strength of plus two, like the dwarven clerics with the pink sheets. You have a plus two. That folksy bow fighter with the green sheets, you also have a plus two. If you're tied, two people to plus two, then both of you get to get out of the carriage, and you're both pushing against that baby. So you'll both roll. Grab the other die. Yep, so if you've tied for strongest, you both have plus two, for example, you both will roll. Get your die ready, both. So you strong heroes, you get out, and you start pushing at the other side of that carriage. Now, I'm going to pretend to be uh, one of you over here, right? Uh, let's say I've got my die, yep, and I need to know my strength bonus, all right? So, okay, look at my strength bonus. It says plus three, okay, fine. Um, so I roll this die, and I add three, right? So I roll that, and whatever it rolls, Say uh, I rolled a five, but I get to add three to it. So even though the die says five, I just tell the dungeon master I got an eight. You don't need to expose the math. Just do the math in your own head. Say I got an eight. Five plus three is eight. All right. That's your number. Now, is that number high enough? The higher the better. Is that number high enough to stop the giant baby from rolling the carriage over the edge? So all you strong heroes holding up your die, roll it now. And look at your strength bonus. Good. Now, look at your strength bonus. If you're yellow, you add three. If you've got a pink or green sheet, you add two. See how that works? You look up your strength bonus, add it. So think of what is your total. That's your number. Think to yourself, what's the total? If two of you rolled, only one of you has to succeed because you're working as a team. Is your total 12 or higher? Ah. If you're that human noble with a yellow sheet, that means you rolled a nine because nine plus three is 12, right? Otherwise, you had to roll higher. 12 is enough to win. If you had the green or pink sheet, you had to roll a 10 or higher. See how that works? Okay. If either of, if two rolled, if either of you got a 12 as a win, that's great. Okay. Remember, you can sanitize however you like after the die is there, so make sure. All right. Now, some parties, you have a winner. So, I'll, again, we'll do a little split here. Some, if you're in a party, a table that has a winner, uh, you got a high enough number. And if you don't have a winner, you didn't get a high enough. All right. So, if you have a winner, I want you all to raise your fists and say, hell yeah, on three. One, two, three. Woo, <laughs> quite a lot of victory out there. All right. So those of you who have a winner in your party, here's what happens to y'all. The strong heroes, they get out of the carriage. The rest of you are terrified inside. You're just not fast enough. Pushing war with that carriage, you versus the baby, back and forth. The baby wants to push it over. You push it back. It's going back and forth, but you're strong enough. Then you hear a voice in the distance. A mum voice. Tyrone! Lunch time! Get back here, you dummy! The giant baby looks very guilty all of a sudden. He brushes himself off. He cleans himself up. He puts a huge finger against one side of his nose and blows. There's a sparkle. There's a ringing sound. Copper coins come out of his nose and fall on the ground. This is your first treasure. <laughs> and the baby runs back to mum. So, if you're in a party that won, that just said, hell yeah, only if your hero got a 12 or higher, write your treasure on your sheet. Down there at the bottom, there's a little thing that says CP, and very tiny letters at the top there. Just write a nine there, a nine next to CP. CP stands for copper pieces. They're, they're cheap coins, but you know, you can still buy a bun or something. You can write with green pencil because they're snotty coins. You know, if you, if you got a green pencil, that'd be especially good. Snot coins. You can write a little note, you know. You want to sell these coins later on? You know, maybe baby giant snot is really magical. 
Who knows? You can make a note of that. You can tell the DM later on. You can tell the DM 20 sessions from now, like, by the way, I've still got the snotty coins. That's fine. Now, if your party did not have a winner, because you did not, your hero did not roll 12 or higher, I want you to stomp your feet and yell, oh shit, on three. One, two, three. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right, those of you with no winner, here's what happens to you. The strong heroes got out of the carriage. The rest of you were terrified inside. You got in that pushing war with the baby. The baby wants to push it over. You try to push back, but it's not hard enough. The baby wins. The carriage rolls over and goes downhill and rolls again and again. You get rolled over. The horses break free. Everybody in your party gets hurt. Everybody loses one hit point. So subtract your hit points yet again if you are in a carriage that, that lost, that lost that fight, just like with the Sturgis. Losing a hit point. All right, we'll merge back together. But you see the basic idea. That was your chance to shine as the strongest one. The story continues. Someone else in the party is going to get a chance to shine, so, or fail trying. Maybe two chances to shine. So, you hit the peak, now you're going downhill. You're finally officially in Timberway Valley, though you're up very high, and it is gorgeous. You just see trees as far as you can see. You're still amongst the snow, but descending quick. There's a valley to the east, as promised. There's a valley immediately. There's some low hills way off in the distance. And then you see a sort of a grayish blue line at the horizon, perfectly flat. It's like, oh, ocean, that must be the sea. Maybe that's the first time ever seeing such a thing. The afternoon is behind you, is glinting off some waves way out there. Now down there in the valley, you see a river. Valleys are made by rivers, and it's going from the north. It takes a big bend and heads out to the sea, that river. You can even see like almost like a toothpick lying off across that, uh, that, that river at one bend is a little stick. It was, that's the bridge. That's Timberway Bridge. We're going to follow this road. It's going to cross that bridge. We're going to go to the farms that are right up there, and they're going to be next to that river, and we're going to be rich, and we're going to be adventurers. All right. So. You heard about that bridge, the forest is kind of thin and there's open spaces, you can almost see little squares of crops way off in the distance. That's your new home. But wait, something happens. Everybody in D&D loves it when the DM says, but something happens. The carriage, you know, you've been sort of excited looking out, but the carriage stops, something's wrong. And you look out why it stopped. There is a figure lying in the road uh, with long hair and this extravagant pompadour. Uh, fancy silver splinted armor and they sit up and they raise their head you can see that they have this sort of silver visor over their eyes like goggles that completely obscures them shiny silver visor but they push it up onto their forehead up into the pompadour and you see there's a burned band over their eyes like a really bad sunburn in the shape of where that visor was from underneath their body they look up with a sort of crazy look, and they pull out a broom that they've been lying on top of with their crazy eyes staring at you. And they cackle madly and look at you and look at your carriage and say, <laughs> horsies, horsies, heat rises. Ah, ah, uh, yes, come on, horsies, I need you to pull the chariot. They point up as they talk about the chariot with this, with this look on their face, a divine look on their face. They get on the broom and start rising up into the air. They wave their hands and they seem to be concentrating on something. There's a glow about them. The metal chains on the horses' harnesses start to glow red hot. And the horses start to scream and panic. Their hair starts to burn. You can smell it. You can see their skin is getting damaged by glowing red hot metal. They, on the broomstick they fly up and serve away hovering very far away from you near the tree line they're casting a spell and you know enough about adventuring is that you can stop a spell by giving them some damage it cause them to it can cause them to lose their concentration it's your only chance but you know that you know as soon as you take that shot they can move out of the line of sight and they can keep concentrating on that spell and keep doing damage it's very nasty magic so you need to get them now, surprise them with the first shot. It won't kill them, but it might make them stop that spell. So it's time for a hero. Who is the best one in your party who has a weapon with an attack bonus of plus seven? 
So you see, sort of in the middle, you have a few weapons, one or two weapons listed. And in the middle column, you can see where the red circle is. There's a number. One of you has a plus seven on that, right? So agree on who that is. If, if you don't have some of the plus seven, right? So you folk hero fighters with the green sheets, yeah? You found that your longbow is a plus seven. You are a very good shot. All right. So if that's so, grab the die because you're going to roll. Now, if you do not have a folk hero fighter, if you don't have a green sheet, okay, who has a short bow? Somebody has a plus five with a short bow. Yeah, maybe a plus five with a, something that shoots. The halfling, halfling rogues with blue sheets. Did you find somebody there? Oh, yep, yeah. got the green. Yep, I think you're good. I think you're good. All right, anybody, if, 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 uh, if, if raise your hand if no, we don't have a green sheet or a, uh, or, or, or a, a blue sheet. Okay, raise your hand because uh, your vo volunteer will help you. All right, so yeah, if you've got the plus five, you're the only one with that, you're the hero. Raise your die if you have a plus five and you can't find a plus seven. So we have one shot, one shot to make it. All right, and again, if two people are tied for whatever reason, again, you both will shoot at the exact same time and only one of you needs to succeed. All right, I think we're all set. So you shooters, you're gonna raise your bows and you're gonna aim. As soon as you do that, they look surprised, like, what the fuck? Like, they're not so expecting to be attacked. They're expecting to hassle you and move on. Ah, but you're heroes. You tend to surprise people. All right. So um, they start to move away on the broom once they see that, but it's too late. You will get your shot off. Now I'm going to pretend to be someone with a green sheet, right? So I've got my die, right? I want to know my attack bonus. I look it up. Is that plus 7 or plus 5? I roll the die. I roll 6. Okay, plus 7 is 13. So now my number is 13. So same deals before, you're about to roll, so get ready. Is it high enough to hurt this loony? Now this loony is wearing shiny armor, is far away and moving back and forth. This is a very hard shot, so the number is, might be a little higher than the last one. So all you shooters that are holding up your die, roll it! And add your attack bonus. <laughs> Great. <laughs> If you're rolling only one die, feel free to get rid of the die that you didn't roll. That's fine like that. But if you both roll, so you can, you can have only one die in the tray, it's fine. All right. So you've added it. So your number is your total 16 or higher. Ah, yes. It's a very hard shot. Got to get through the armor. You got to fire far away. Hard to hit some of that kind of protection. If you're a folk hero fighter with that green sheet, I mean, you had to roll a nine to get that high, right? Nine plus that huge seven is equal to 16. That's enough to win. If you have, if you have blue sheets, you had to roll an 11. You're not, not easy. If both of you rolled, if either of you got a 16, it's still a win. All right, so if your party has a winner, everybody raise your fists and say, hell yeah, on three. One, two, three. Hell yeah. All right, those of you with a winner, here's what happens to you. The bow, twang. The arrow hits, it goes through that gap in the armor that you're aiming for, right near their waist. It breaks their concentration, and the heat stops. The horses are going to be okay. They pull the arrow out of their side, they fling it back at you and say, rude! And bracelets fly off of their arm and fall down onto the road and tingle onto the road. They flee west on their broom, over your head, the way that you came but there's silver in the road. And again, if you have a winner, you've got treasure. So if you're in a party that won, only if you're in a hero who got 16 or higher, write down in the silver area next to silver pieces. These aren't literally silver pieces, so you can write it next to it. Write silver bracelet, and then in parentheses put one SP. So that stands. So you don't, you don't necessarily put a one in the silver piece thing. Write down what it is, because you have to sell it to someone who's willing to buy it from you. But you think you could sell it for one silver piece, or it could be melted down to be enough silver to be make a silver piece. That means you can sell it. OK. At a distance, however, also, you know, you have the wherewithal to see that as that person flew over, something else silver fell from that person into the woods. Do you remember what it might be? Because it's a little gleam of silver that falls into the woods. So that's a teaser. If you come back to the full session and you remember, it's like, hey, we're going to go back to where that asshole, you know, <laughs> dropped that silver thing. We're going to go into the woods because I'm going to remember where that is and I'm going to get that bit of silver. So remember that. Mention it to your dungeon master later on. These are why, why you can make some mental notes or written notes. The horse is okay. The horse, their hair got scorched off a bit. Vistra is very thankful. Remember Vistra, the driver? She is very thankful to you. Now, if your party did not have a winner because you didn't get a 16 in your party, stomp your feet and yell, oh shit, on three. Ready? One, two, three. Oh shit. 
<laughs> a lot of you. Well, those of you with no winner, here's what happens to you. If it was, now you can tell your own story. I would probably specialize this if I was just the table with you. So if you did a pretty good roll that got close, imagine the arrow hit them, but it bounced off of their armor, right? If you did a bad roll, like if it, your total's below 10, it just missed them entirely. <laughs> but either way, they, they give you the fork. Uh, they uh, fly off to the side, out of sight. And the trees are in the way, you can't shoot them again, but they're still concentrating on that spell. It's devastating, it keeps going hotter and hotter. You have no choice but to pull those chains and stirrups off of the horse, all the metal part off the horses. You uncouple them, they're screaming, and you all get burns as you do so. You all lose one hit point. If you did not have a winner in your party, you lose one hit point, just like before. The horses are burned very badly, so they have lost hit points as well. And they're not going to get better very easily. So I'll have to keep that in mind as a dungeon master as well. And Vistra is really upset. Not upset at you, but upset at the world. Just making some sad verses, a little bit of a requiem. The horses aren't dead, but she's saying a requiem anyway. That's who Vistra is. Well, that took a lot, okay, and we're gonna merge back together. And regardless of who you are, that took quite a lot of time. You had to re-harness the horses, or you had to calm them down. That giant baby delayed you quite a bit. The driver and the Vistra, and Vistra, they're panicking. They're saying, we've got to get to the valley floor before dark, and we're way behind schedule. The guards peer out, you know, behind. The sun is setting. Of course, you're up next to a mountain, like the sun is gonna set even earlier than usual. The shadow of the mountain, you're already in it, and it's extending down the mountain. It's extending across the valley floor, and they're pointing to a sunny spot. We've got to get there before the shadow falls. It's gonna be close. So let's go, go, go! So they whip the horses. They roll that carriage down. It's rocking back and forth. This is something where sometimes I'll just skip over and say, oh, don't worry about this part of the story. But if we felt like it, or if I felt like it, like, oh, let's roll some dice to see whether the carriage, you know, goes off the road or something. But I'll be, I'll speed up the story a little bit and say, you managed not to go off the edge, but you are having a wild ride as you go. The winding road, it goes down a steep mountainside and flattens out. There's boulders all around. Obviously, they've crumbled off the mountain as they've sort of settled into place. And you're in the shadow, but there's a line ahead of sunlight. It's just a minute away. You're racing towards it, but you're gonna be too late. Because rumble and crack. The boulders roll down from either side, crack into the middle of the road. There's small figures that seem to have pushed them. These sh in the shadows are hiding these little creatures that seem to be the ones to push it. They collided, and whoa, the horses, they rear back, they're confused, the road is blocked, and on all sides, creatures swarm out from the shadows, appear from the boulders, they're very hard to see, hiding very well and camouflaged. Vistra screams to the sky, no, we almost reached the sunlight. Gods, morning lord, save us, bring us your light. The gods may hear, but they're not gonna do anything for you. The kobolds attack. Kobolds! They're short. They're only about as big as children. They come up to your waist, but they've got knives! And they are fully adult. They've got slings that they swing around. They've got knives. They look very, you know, snouty and dragonish. They've got beady eyes and sort of dragon-like features. But you don't have a whole lot of time to, to take in the details because an attack is starting. Uh, they're covered with scales and those daggers and swings, their beady cold eyes scan you. Their greed has overcome them. And kobolds, again, you don't have to be evil if you're a kobold, but kobolds just have many stories about their greed and lust for gold tends to make them do things like this, which is rob you and probably kill you in the, uh, try to kill you in the process. Evil acts from these kobolds are expected. The carriage starts rocking back and forth. The kobolds are slashing the straps that are holding your uh, things onto the carriage. There's a chest that's freed. It falls off the back of the carriage and it cracks open. You can sort of see it through the window in this confusion. The doors are trying to get pulled open. You can see that this chest broke open and there's some kind of big shiny metal sphere, like metal hoops all around some sort of central ball. Very unusual thing that none of you recognize. Might be somebody else in the carriage. Where, what is this thing? But the kobolds, they just keep looting all of your stuff. The others move in to attack, but the guards, they call for help because these kobolds are not gonna be happy just taking your stuff. They know that you have more gold as well. And they start pulling open the carriage doors and wielding those weapons. You all get out and you're ready to fight. All right. We are about to play a part of D&D. &D. It's like a game within a game. This is combat. 
Uh, now the rules are usually more precise in combat because life and death are on the line. Uh, this combat is going to be extremely basic, um, but as you advance, the game tactics, they get quite complex. It's a head-to-head -head match, you know, your team against the team of kobolds. So it's a bit like a footy match. You have sort of plays and odds and things that you try to do. Uh, and the combat goes in rounds just to keep things sort of in real time. Each round is only like six seconds, but you know, we, you do, we do it out of the table. So in the story, it's six seconds long. At the table, it takes a little bit longer. It gets faster as we go. So each of you at the table, you will get one turn to attack a kobold. Then each of the monsters, they get a turn to attack. Sometimes they go first, sometimes they go second. We'll find out how that turns out here. So the monsters each get one turn to attack whoever they want, and I control who the monsters attack. And I think logically, who would they attack? You know, I try to sort of think like the monster would think. An attack can kill its target, wound its target, and just knock out the target. can weaken the target or slow them down. So there's a bunch of things that happen as an attack. Uh, if you do not eliminate or you know, take out of commission monsters, you just end up with more chances for them to attack you. So it's you versus them. All right. Da, da, da. All right, so uh, I'm going to sort of have a volunteer. So I'll, I'll sort of I'll, I'll point over there. You don't have to do anything. You can stay right there. So I'm going to see you have a sort of a, a, a someone with a blue sheet over in the corner. I've got this script for the blue sheet over there. Okay, all right, you with the blue sheet. All right, let's walk through your attack, all right? So uh, now what are you? You're a rogue and you're using a sword. Okay, now let's pretend that you rolled a 10. Okay, let's pretend you roll that die and you add a 10. Okay, well, the kobold's a little tough to hit. Let's see here. Okay, the kobold has an armor class of 12. That's that red circle. Now, I'm looking at the stats of the kobold, but it's like a character, right? It has stats just like you do. You have an armor class. We'll get to that later. The kobold's armor class is 10. That's generally how hard it is to hit, right? 12, that's not very high. The higher the number, the harder it is to hit, but 10 is less than 12. Right? So that would mean that you would miss the kobold. Maybe it's a close thing, so it would like, dig into its hide but not damage it. Or maybe it would jump out of the way. But you are a hero. Ah, you are not ordinary. You know how to fight. So you get to add what? What's your bonus next to your short sword? Uh, attack? Uh, yeah. Plus five. Plus five. All right. So you get to add five to your roll, just like you learned about from your other rolls. Okay, that is 15. That's more than 12. Hell yeah! All right, that means you hit the kobold in that case. All right, that was just pretend. Too bad. Forget it. You didn't actually roll that. Okay, now, just say, while we're pretending, let's pretend you rolled a five. Okay, obviously. Well, not obviously. So the, I want to go through these bit at a time. So if you rolled a five, still add five. Five plus five is 10. 10 is less than 12, less than the, the armor class. So fair is fair. You do not hit the kobold in that case. Even though you're a hero, even though you added five, still not enough, and you would miss it. And of course, now it's mad at you, and it's going to come after you, all right? So, oh, shit. Okay, so if you're all ready, you're all going to do some of this now with your own round of combat. So we'll do this first, where the first characters I call out, I'm going to call you out by color, by you know, class, as it's called. They are the fastest to get stuck into combat, and this is really based on your dexterity bonus, by the way. The more dexter, the higher your dex bonus is, dexterity, the faster you tend to act in combat. So, but everyone, everyone imagine the scene. You know, it's good to sort of play it out in your head. So imagine you're kind of watching a slow motion movie, but even when it's not your turn, it's good to pay attention. Okay. Ah, thank you. Okay, good. Yes, no, I'll be changing in just a moment. Okay, great. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. So you halfling rogues with the blue sheets, uh, you are brave. You run into the fray, you got your short sword out, it's large in your small hand because you're a halfling. You're about child size as well, a little bigger than the kobold, but this short sword looks big to you. Uh, the kobold is slashing its dagger at a guard, but you come out as blind side. Ah, you do a sneaky attack. That's what rogues are very good at. Now, all of you rogues with the blue sheet, roll a d20. And you're a hero, so add that plus five that was next to your short sword. And no, your total. So you got a die roll, and you add it. Is your total 12 or higher? As I said, that's the armor class of the kobold. All right. If you got a 12 or higher, say hell yeah on three. One, two, three. Good job, rogues. All right, let's tell your story. If you rolled high enough, if you added up to 12, you rogue, you snuck up behind it and cut its throat. Yeah, oh, it goes down with one blow. <laughs> Spectacular bloody death. Yeah, you could probably cackle like that. It's very common for rogues to have a good cackle. Practice your cackle. So you halfling rogues with the blue sheets, if you did not roll high enough, if it did not add up to 12, you missed the kobold. Now it's my turn to say, hell yeah! So here's what happened to you. As you ran up, the kobold saw out of the corner of its eye, 
it saw you, it turned its scaly shoulder towards you, kind of gave you a check, and knocked you back before you slashed it. Ah, the kobold is now is still alive, and now it wants to attack you, rogue. You are in trouble. Let's move on to the elven wizards. You have purple sheets. Purple sheets, purple sheets. Let's say wizard up in the corner, purple sheets. All right. Now, you elven wizards, you hang back from combat, okay? Uh, <laughs> you'll find out why. So, but you hold up your palm, you swirl it around, and you chant a few magic words, and a blue-white beam shoots out of your hand. It's like a beam from a torch, and it goes a very long distance. It is magic. You are still aiming it, though, so you still got to roll something. You got to roll a d20, and you add five because you're intelligent and all that stuff. So you are an elven wizard. Roll a d20. And add five to it now. Elven wizards with your beam of cold light. <laughs> All right, elven wizards. Remember, you rolled it. You add five, so you have a number, your total. If you rolled high enough, if your total was 12 or higher, say hell yeah on three. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> wizards kind of dialed back like, yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. All right. All right. That beam that hits the kobold in the leg, it freezes the leg, ice breaks out on it, it's sort of limping, sort of slowly, and now you can kind of paint it up and down, like you sort of cover the whole body with that beam of light. It gets covered with ice, it covers up completely, it falls over dead, stiff, and frozen. All right. Now, if you're an elven wizard and you did not roll high enough, if you did not get a 12, it's my turn to say hell yeah! because the beam flashes over the kobold, maybe makes a stripe across its leg, but not enough to slow it down or hurt it. It dodges, it rolls, it, you can't really get the beam onto it, and it's, uh, the beam freezes the ground, but not the kobold. It's alive, it starts looking at you, swinging its sling over its head, and it's gonna aim for you next, it's angry. Meanwhile, this is all happening the same six seconds, by the way, in slow motion. The human folk hi uh, hero fighter with the green sheets. Got the green sheets, it's your turn. You pull out that trusty bow. You scan for an open target, and you know you're a good shot. You see a kobold leaning out between two boulders. Uh, and it's going to be very hard to hit, but you're probably the only one who has a chance, because you're like a really good shot. Uh, and this kobold means trouble. All right, you are confident. So you aim at that kobold, and an arrow flies towards it with a twang. Roll your d20. Now you're only going to add five, not seven, because of those boulders. It's called cover, right? So, you, so it's a little bit harder to succeed. So you only add five to your d20. Only add five. What's your total? If you're old high enough, if your total is 12 after adding only five, yell hell yeah on three. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thunk. An arrow goes into the kobold's neck. Yeah, what a shot. The kobold is a, falls away, dead away. All right. If you did not roll high enough, if it's not 12, my turn to say hell yeah, because the kobold, uh, the arrow grazes that rock. You know, you would have hit it if it weren't for that rock. If you rolled really low, you wouldn't have hit it anyway, but you don't have to tell people that. Yep, the kobold dodges out of the way, the arrow misses it, and is diverted to the side. That kobold is alive and wants to attack you next, folk hero. <laughs> the human noble fighters with the yellow sheet. Yeah, you are toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You're the kind of fighter who likes to get up close and personal. You face down a kobold with its dagger. You have a great axe. You use both hands with it. So you go charging up ah, with both hands and chop down. So roll a d20 and add five, hero. Great axe, you got a plus five on that great axe. All right, if you got a 12, yell hell yeah on three. One, two, three. Hell yeah. All right, you take that axe and you chop it in half. Yeah, it just goes straight through the kobold. It dies at your feet, yes. If you did not roll high enough, hell yeah to me, all right. Your great axe was just too slow. It jumps out of the way and <laughs> digs into the ground, that axe, but uh, it is now mad at you. Lastly, dwarven clerics with the pink sheets. Take a look at your pink sheets there. You are special. You even more special. You see a kobold is way off behind the rocks, very far away, and it's, you hear it more than see it. It sounds like it's strangling someone. You think, and you just see the top of its head pop up once in a while. It must be one of those carriage passengers, one of the other ones in your carriage. They, you, one, some of them ran at this attack. You think it's one of them, and they're being strangled by the kobold. 
Anyone else in the party would have to run really a long time to get there, and who knows what bad thing will happen in the meantime. Shooters are going to find it very hard to hit, even those with the good with the bow. So this is your target. You call on whatever god you believe in, whatever deity you have. Yes, there are many gods, plural, like the Greek mythos, like many mythos throughout all the world. There's multiple deities, multiple gods in D&D, and they are indisputably real. Now, maybe they're just very powerful adventurers. Maybe they are truly, on, they don't seem to be omnipotent because they fight with each other a lot, and they seem to have very large but limited powers. They're very jealous of each other. They're very commanding, but they give you magic. So those deities, uh, you have a deity in mind. Part of your character choice will be which deity you worship. Uh, there might be something on the back part of your sheet, but don't worry about that. You'll be able to change that later on. Whatever you're worshiping, you call on your god, and a holy bolt of fire appears. It comes down from the sky, or it comes up from the ground, depending on what kind of deity you're worshiping. The kobold will be very hard to hit any other way, but when god is doing it, that doesn't matter. All right, so you pray, and a bolt of holy fire appears. You're going to roll a d20 and add five. This is based on your wisdom and how good you are at spells. Roll d20 and add five, hero. All right. If you rolled high enough, if it adds up to a 12, you can yell, hell yeah, on three. One, two, three. All right, clerics. That kobold is burned to a crisp. Good job. If you did not roll high enough and it didn't add up to a 12, now it's my turn to say, hell yeah. Now. It's very important to clarify this. The fire was on target. God didn't make the mistake. It was your fault. <laughs> Gods don't like to be told they're wrong. The kobold saw it coming and rolled out of the way. All right, a dog away is mad at you, but at least it's not strangling its victim anymore. So you did some good in the world. Okay, now it's the kobold's turn. So I, controlling the world, control the monsters, and I decided, you know, they were a little slower in combat, but they're numerous and they're angry, so they get a turn just like you. Now. We're gonna have a little bit of another split here. If you did not kill your kobold, please keep that in mind because you're in big danger. It wants to attack you. But if you killed your kobold, that's great, good job. But there's lots of kobolds and there's more coming up. So you'll still be in some danger. I'm gonna call out to each of you to see if a kobold hits you. Now the die is mine to roll. So I'm gonna get a die and with my witnesses here, I'm gonna be honest here, I'm an honest DM. <laughs> Just like you did the monster, the monster uses the same rules. I'm going to roll and I'm going to see if it meets your AC. Wait a minute, what is AC? All right. All right, armor class. So you can see up in the corner is a shield up in the top of your sheet. Inside that shield is an AC and you see different characters. You can look at each other's sheets. It's interesting to see. Different armor classes. Easier or harder to hit. I'll explain why as we go. It's above your hit points there, yep. Okay, so I'm going to roll my die, and I only get to add four, because I'm only a kobold. I'm not as heroic as you. Oh, fine. That's fine. I'm going to add four, and I'm still going to try to kill ya. So I want to roll high, uh, and I'm going to go after the halfling rogues. Okay, so you halfling rogues, the blue sheets, talking to you. Now your AC is what? 14. 14, that's right. Now you have leather armor. You don't wear heavy chain metal armor, because it's too clunky. You can't sneak around, so, you know, you've got decent armor. Uh, but uh, it's not quite as high as metal would be. But you've got high dexterity. Ah, you can dodge around. That also affects your armor class when you got leather on. The kobold rushes in from the shadows. Man, you didn't even see it coming. This darkness is really messing with you. It lashes out with this dagger. Uh, so this is, uh, th this is, this is the, uh, uh, this is the one, sorry, I'm playing up. Uh, yeah, if you missed, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so if you haven't killed the kobold. So everybody gets this, right? So everybody is gonna have this. Remember, you got multiple things. So even if you killed your kobold, you are under attack as well. All right, I'm gonna roll. Roll my die, add four. Okay, I rolled a five, I'm gonna add four, I get a nine. Nine, that's less than 14. Oh shit. All right, that's less than 14. Rogues, you can yell, hell yeah, one, two, three, rogues. Oh, yeah. yeah, all right, the rogue missed. You duck underneath that dagger. Uh, you know, it doesn't even scratch your armor. You're so dexterous because I rolled so low. You are able to get out of danger entirely, no harm at all. Now. If you are a rogue that did not kill your kobold, right? Remember I said it was coming after you? That kobold is going to attack you. So you get a second attack if you did not kill your kobold. So I'm gonna repeat. Okay, I rolled a 12 plus four, that's a 16. I think that's higher than 14, hell yeah! All right. 
You got hit. Well, you can yell oh shit on three. One, two, three. Anybody got hit? Oh, you rogues. Yeah, if you're a rogue that did not kill your kobold, I'm going for you. I just rolled a 16. So if you are a rogue that did not kill your kobold, and you, and that's just, I rolled high enough. On three, yell oh shit. Please just make the DM feel good. One, two, three. <laughs> <All right. laughs> the dagger slashes your arm it cuts through your leather ah oh, your leather armor man you start bleeding a bit all the, you with, with the blue sheets if you just got hit subtract two hit points it's getting more severe all right but if you're a rogue that uh that uh that you know, you so yeah good good for you for killing that one Okay, we'll go faster now. Elves with the wi the wizards with the purple sheets is coming after you. Your AC is what? Twelve. Twelve? Oh, right. You don't wear armor. Yeah, it takes skills, the um, training to wear armor. And, you know, you got to be in tune with magic. You can't be bothered with armor. But you've got pretty high dexterity for a wizard, so usually wizards have even lower ACs. So you got a twelve. All right, you can dodge. All right, the kobold, this is for all of y'all, pops up in the distance. Its sling is zipping around his head, just like I said, yeah? It flings its sling at you, a stone flies at you, I roll my die. I roll a 10, I add four, that's a 14. Hey, that's a hit, that's higher than your 12. Wizards. Wizards, you can yell, oh shit, on three. One, two, three. <laughs> the stone cracks your collarbone. Ow! Oh, all you elf wizards with purple sheets. If you did not kill, so you, yeah, so you, all you, all you who who got your purple sheets, all of you subtract two hit points. You know how by now. All of you elven wizards, all of you lost two hit points. Any wizards at zero hit points yet? Maybe you had sort of some bad sturge troubles. No. Okay. All right. All right. Now, if you're a wizard who had not killed your kobold, bad news, you've got a second attack coming for you. So if you did not kill your kobold, this is going to apply to you. A second attack just for you. Ooh, a 12 plus four, that's a 16, even better. That's higher. You get hit again, wizards. You don't have to yell, oh shit, I know how you feel. So if you had not killed your kobold, wizard, that second one hits you, subtract another two hit points. Ooh, is anybody at zero yet? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Nobody's zero? If you're zero. Okay. Oh, you had a shit day, hey? Yeah. <laughs> Got some sturge problems. The giant baby thing maybe didn't go so well. It's like, all right, all right. Well, I've got good news for you. Hang on. Okay, hang on. You're not dead. That's a good thing. You don't have to leave the room. Okay, good news. All right. Okay, so now, if you're a wizard, you already did that. All right. So, those of you who are down, Maybe something will save you, but we're in the middle of combat. You're temporarily out. Human, folk hero fighters, if you got the green sheets, your armor class is what? Green sheet fighters? 14. 14, yeah, you've got leather armor. You frankly can't afford really expensive armor like some sort of warriors that might be sitting next to you. But you've got chain mail, that's pretty good. And you got high dexterity, so you're pretty good at dodging. So 14 is a perfectly good armor class for a fighter. All right, a kobold appears behind that boulder, uh, another one of those boulders. It hurls a javelin at you. Ooh, creative. I'm gonna roll my die, gonna add four. Ooh, two plus four is a six. Ah, no, a miss. Folk heroes, yell hell yeah on three. One, two, three. Hell yeah. All right, that kobold missed you. All right, you twist away, you know, like it didn't even scratch your armor. You're perfectly fine. Now, if you're a folk hero that did not kill your kobold last time, that one that you missed is coming for you. So remember, this shot is for you, folk hero fighters. Second, ooh, is a 15 plus four. That's a 19. That is higher than your armor class of 14. So you got hit. Lose two hit points. If you are a folk hero fighter that did not kill that kobold, lose two hit points. I don't think any of you could possibly be dead unless you had a really shit day. Raise your hand if you got zero. Zero hit points? No, you're fine. Okay. Fight continues. Now let's go to the human noble fighters. Now, in real D&D, this goes about five times faster because obviously I'm having to talk a lot extra and we all learn faster. So combat can go faster, but you know, we're learning a bit at a time. Human noble fighters with yellow sheets. What is your armor class? 17. 17, whoa, you got good heavy mail is fancy. Yeah, all right, expensive stuff. The kobold runs up to you, it swings a club at a sprint. I'm gonna roll my die. I got, ooh, 17, and I had four, that's 21. That's still enough to hit you. Oh, your expensive armor, no, it still goes through, you get hurt. 
you lose two hit points, fighters, even with your fancy armor. You lost two hit points. All fighters with yellow sheets subtract two hit points. All right. If you are a yellow noble fighter that did not kill your kobold, you know the drill. There's a second kobold. The one that you missed with your axe is going to come at you. You can roll again. Another 17! Hey! Another four! That's 21! Hell yeah! You yellow fighters who did not kill your kobold, you lose another two hit points. All right. Last but not least, Dwarven Clerics with your pink sheets. Your armor class is what? Can't be that good. 18! Oh, yeah. You have got chainmail and a shield. Huh? You've got a one-handed weapon. That yellow sheet fighter has a two-handed weapon, does a little bit more damage. You have only a one-handed weapon, doesn't do as much damage, but you're better armor because you got to stay alive because you got to keep everybody else alive. That's your job as a cleric. So, 18. Very nice. You hold the warhammer in one hand and you've got that shield in the other. A kobold appears at a distance and uses its sling. It flings it at you. I'm going to roll my die. I roll a one. Oh. Oh, that's always a miss. It doesn't matter what you add. It's always a miss when you roll a one. It probably drops its sling. It hits its buddy, whatever you like. Usually we like to t tell a story about what kind of embarrassing, terrible thing happens when you roll a one. But man, that was bad. Okay, you're perfectly safe. Oh, unless you are a cleric who missed your kobold. Huh? So yeah, if, if, if it misses, you know, that's fine. Clerics yell, yell hell yeah, clerics. One, two, three. Yeah, all right. That's good, that's good. Yeah, it just doesn't even come close. But if you're a cleric that did not kill your kobold, let's continue the story with a second attack by that kobold that you tried to cast that spell on and not God, you missed. Okay, here we go. When 11 plus four is 15. No, it's lower than your armor class. All right, nope, you got missed again, you clerics. All right, okay. Anybody else, is, so you with zero hit points. Had a shit day, understandable, you know. Maybe your, your party, did your party let you down? Who knows, bad luck. But you're special. Ordinary people, when they get to zero hit points, they're dead dead. But you've always had this ability. Maybe this happened to you once before. You go unconscious, you need to be helped out, but you can be brought back from this very grave state. It's like you're in the ER. And while you were clinging to life, you saw the gods. Like you got this glimpse of the afterlife. This is where your soul was going to head if you were to actually die. Later on, so you could write that on your sheet, say, died, or, you know, died, comma, saw God. Uh, you didn't actually die, but it's more dramatic, say, died, saw God. Because you can tell your DM, that's me later on, says, oh, maybe later on you might bring this up, because maybe you'll get a bit of a bonus later on. You come to life with a bottle in your mouth. Vistra has a healing potion. She, in the middle of the attack, came over, pulled this red vial out and stuck it down your throat and this warm fluid went down your throat and uh, come up, you have a couple hit points. You have three hit points now. You come back with three hit points. No, five hit points. I rolled higher than that. Five hit points. Okay. So, that was one round of combat. I've got some good news, right? Uh, you and the guards, you definitely killed some kobolds. That's good. I've got some bad news. There's a lot of kobolds, and you're only level one. Oh, you did well. But you know, it's just like the shows, you know, like Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad or whatever, you know, Lord of the Rings. Even good fighters can lose. A good story can come from defeat. It has gotten dark. And you know why Vistra was so terrified at getting here while it's dark, uh, why she wanted to be here in the daylight. Kobolds are swarming from every direction, and their shots and their stabs come from a direction that you can't even see. You can't raise your shield. You can't dodge out of the way. They are flinging death. The horses go down, stabbed with knives, dead horses. The other horse runs off. You see driver, Vistra, you see her throat get slit in front of you, and she falls at your feet. And you know she is dead dead. She's not a hero like you. One of the guards is having his head bashed in with a rock, and his cousin comes up, jumps off of a rock, ah, stabs the kobold who's bashing her cousin. But the other kobolds, they're taking no prisoners. They swarm on top of her. You're quite not sure what happens. You know, the dagger plunges into her back and she falls out of sight. Who knows what happened to her? The other passengers surrender, but the kobolds aren't taking prisoners. They don't want somebody to tell the stories of where their ambush is. They put daggers to throats. You heroes are surrounded and facing death. And you think this is the end. And that's the breaks, because you're level one. Right, you see that up the upper corner? That one next to that word means that you know, you're seeking adventure and you're just at the beginning. 
you get experience as you fight, and then you become level two. You'll have more hit points, you have more skills. Level two or three, maybe you could have taken on this fight, but not today. So good night, everybody. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, no, no. You think you're breathing your last. You think this is the end. And especially well-armored and well-bejeweled kobold, she sees that broken open chest that I mentioned, and that shiny sphere that was inside it, and she calls out to the others, and they all stop killing everybody. The kobolds call her Nat Nat, and she seems to be a leader of some sort. She warily kicks open that chest and takes a look at that thing in the gloom. She casts a spell where light, you know, sort of shines onto it. You see that brass sphere again. You most intelligent ones in the party, you've got a high intelligence, you recognize this is an orrery. This is like a simulation of like a solar system with orbits that go around a star and there's planets and comets and meteors and stuff. There's a lot of hoops. It looks a bit broken, but you know, basically it. Nat Nat gets very excited by this. Everybody's talking about the orrery. Big, big orrery fans in the audience. So Nat Nat's very excited by this, all right? And she says more to the kobolds in kobold language. Some of you know Draconic. Uh, if you're a noble fighter or a wizard, you'll learn that you actually learn Draconic. This is the language of dragons, and kobolds speak this language. Kobolds don't use the word Ori. They use this weird sounding long word, a lot of X's and S's in it. It's very strange. But as they say so, they point up at an angle into the heavens, all in the same direction, sort of eastward and upward, staring off as they talk about it, all in synchrony. Nat Nat wants you to stay alive, it turns out. You are taken as prisoners. They shackle you. They want to sell you and this orrery to some kobolds down south to be very interested in what you must know about this machine you've got there. They want to keep you all alive. One of you must own this thing, and you must know how to use it. So, all of you in the party, you are alive, but you are captive. Most of the other carriage passengers, they survived. Some are lying dead in the road. They're much worse off than you. Your hero heart must be burning right now. Survival, adrenaline, anger, maybe even excitement, like we lived, right? Something's awakening in you. You get a chance, you'll escape this, but now is not the time. This is not quite your time to get out of trouble. There's just too many. So manacled as you are, your stuff is taken away from you, your weapon is taken away from you, your armor is kept on because it's very hard to remove armor. You are gagged, or you've got this bag over your head that makes it sort of hard to, to, to see, and you can't see at all and talk. A couple dozen kobolds start taking you. As far as you can tell, you go off the road, you start crunching through sort of leaves and needles and stuff and bumping into trees. Nat Nat and most of the others, they stay behind. They take all the loot that they've gone. They head north, so the kobolds split into two groups. And you take a note of where those kobolds go as they go to the north, because you're being hustled off to the south. Again, you might want to remember this later on. This is actually the start of the adventure that defines you as adventurers. If you had won this fight, you would have gone on to the farm. Maybe you would have, you know, raised some pigs. Maybe you would have gotten rich. Maybe you would have fought some goblins. And then you would have been thankful because someday the goblin attacks would have stopped. Why? Because heroes stopped it. You are those heroes now. You are the ones that are going to stop this invasion at its source. Luckily for you, you lost this battle because you're being kidnapped and you're going to be brought to the heart of what plagues Timberway Valley. All right, these heroes are you. Well, heroes, you are poked, you are prodded, you are sick, you are tired. You're led in the line southward, off the road. Night has fallen. You're in the, if you're in a party with a good wisdom score, you have a good sense of direction, you can tell that you're kind of heading southeast, off the road, through the forest. And you who understand the Kobo language, they're debating how to find someone. They need to bring you to someone. All right, this is a little break. When you stretch, please take only five minutes. You can buy things, including D&D stuff, but uh, drinks and stuff. But do take only five, five minutes. Come on back, use the loo, all that stuff. Uh, you can leave stuff on your table. Come back and sit in the same place. Please come back. We've got more chances to shine. You're going to find out what happens as you go south. And you have more chance. Those of you who have not rolled for your chance to shine, you have your chance. Congratulate each other on that sweet hit. Give each other sympathy if they got badly hurt. We'll start in five minutes. Uh, please wear your mask as you move around. Well, you should be wearing your mask anyway. Thank you. Uh, those of you on the no video table, we're going to stop here. Okay, thanks again, everybody. What we're going to do is start. <laughs> okay, we're back from the break to continue your adventure. Here we go. 
As you recall, you're being led to the south by these kobolds towards a destination where they want you to meet somebody. Well, the kobolds start chattering with each other, and uh, you can sort of feel the heat uh, of, a, of a bonfire ahead. You know, like the, the, the bags over your head are sort of pulled up because you start bumping into trees so much the kobolds realize you're going really slow. So they've put gags in your mouth and se- instead was even more unpleasant, but at least you can see. So you can see this bonfire up ahead, kind of amongst some ruins of some sort. You end up in the ruins of a big square tower that must have been made of red bricks, but it's down almost to its foundation, just some nubs of walls in all directions. Sitting in the middle of that tower, staring into that fire, is a human in red robes. He's got sharp black beard, and he's got his hair slicked down. His face, it isn't wrinkled, but there's something really very old about this face that you can't quite put your finger on. Coming out of the bonfire that he's staring into is a spiked black chain glowing sort of faintly with the heat. And you are sure that as you're coming in, that chain twitched and moved a little bit. The kobolds uh, are all excited by this. Uh, He seems to have been expecting you as he looks up and the kobolds chatter about him, but they're moving very slowly and warily, like they're taking a lot of caution, and they're facing towards him. One talks to him in Draconic, and again, if you understand this, you could hear a bit, and he's talking, their kobolds are saying about all the things that you did in battle, like spells that was cast, that beam, that arrow shot, that god being called, stuff like that. The man nods, he gestures to a corner where there's some gold coins and piles, and the kobolds take the gold coins. You sort of bowing, some sort of reward. The kobolds push all of you and your party into the middle. You're uncomfortably close to the fire. You're kind of in a ring around that bonfire. They have pikes that they pick up from right where the tower is and sort of, sort of poking at you from a distance. The man looks at each of you with this sneer on his face. And he says, prove to me that you are not useless and perhaps I will spare you some of the pain of this world. Who else have you ever seen wearing red like me? Time for a hero of a different sort. Now who among you has the best wisdom score? Wisdom with a plus three or plus two maybe, plus three. You clerics with the pink sheet, you have a plus three on your wisdom, okay? Some of you soldier clerics, that's right, yeah. If you don't have a cleric, if you don't have a pink sheet, uh, that noble fighter with the yellow sheet, you're actually fairly wise, all right? You're good, you're good at perception, by the way. So it means you're good at spotting details, this question will matter. You're used to looking at clothes as a matter of status, perhaps, your noble background. If there's no cleric in the party, uh, you with the yellow sheets are gonna go, okay. So, you who are holding up a sheet, there's no die this time. If you're a hero, just be holding up your sheet and uh, be ready to write something down. Just get a little space on your sheet. That front has got a lot of blank spot. Get a pencil and get ready to write. All right, this is gonna be timed. Write down at least one and no more than three answers to this question on your sheet. In the story so far, write down the times you saw someone else wearing a red item of clothing. That's what this man in red is asking you. He doesn't count, he's, he's not one of the three. There have been three, one, two, or three. Write down anything you like. You can get ideas from others for the next few seconds. Write down the best three ideas. We have just 30 seconds to do this. <laughs> Five seconds left. Okay, everybody stop talking. But don't put your pencils down. Stop talking. Now you clerics, if you are a cleric with the pink, the pink sheet or if you're the, that folk hero, you are the wisest one, I'll give you personally another 10 seconds to think in silence and write. You've got another 10 seconds only. If, if, if you're a cleric, that plus three with that noble, continue to think. 10 seconds. Write down your answers. Three answers total. Okay, stop. Put your pencils down. Here are the answers. 
The corpse in the library had a red silk lounging robe. The dwarf who was singing in the inn had a red fur coat. He was singing that drunken war song. And the giant baby had a red sash around his cute waist. Now make a check mark next to each of your answers that you got right. Up to three. Three answers, right down, right up to three check marks. One, zero to three check marks should now be on your sheet. All right. Those of you who got at least one right, at least one check mark, you and your party is a winner. And here is what happens. The man in the red robes nods with interest. He gestures to the kobolds. For each check mark that you have, for each correct answer, if you wrote down three or fewer, of course, I'm hoping you didn't write down seven things, but each correct answer, for each one, the kobold gives you a little red berry. It is a good berry, it's called. And each one, you gain one hit point by eating it. You, as the winner, you get to decide. You're, you're the cleric or you're the, or you're the, 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 the other one, the, uh, the yellow one. Uh, you uh, can write this down and save all those berries, one, two, or three good berries. Write them down on your sheet. Or you can eat all three right now and get three hit points. Or you can give them to someone else in your party in any proportion you like. So if you have one good berry, there's only one hit point to give to somebody. Or you can say, like, no, we will need this more later. Can you write it down on your sheet if you're keeping it. If you're eating it, you'll get a hit point. I'll talk about getting hit points. Only as many berries. If you got three check marks, you have three good berries. One check mark, one good berry. If you got no answers wrong, just hang on a sec. I'll tell your story. Choose now. Okay. So any berries not eaten? Now write down on your sheet, you clerics, or if you don't have a cleric, a noble fighter, you have one, two, or three good berries, they're called. And you can write down one HP next to it. If you uh, get your HP, yes, you actually gain hit points for the first time. Do I have an example of that? No, I don't. That's fine. Okay. So, yeah, same thing as you did before, subtracting, but now you're adding the hit points if you go. All right. If you did not get any answers right, here is what happens to you. The man in the red robes sneers at you. You have nothing to give him. Useless, he says. When we finally rule you natives, you'll be like sheep for us to use. The spiked black chain that was in the fire suddenly lashes out in a circle. Those of you in a group that did not get any answers right, you are slashed and burned by this chain, and you all lose one hit point. Your whole party loses one hit point if you got none of these three answers right. Anybody zero hit points? Vistra is not around anymore. This could be more serious. Raise your hand. No, no. Nobody's at zero. All right. OK. The man in red, he waves away the kobolds, waves you away. You are put back into your captivity, and you are led away, continue to the south through the night. Your march continues. Gagged and manacled, you are tired. It's been hours. You've been marching for miles. It's been hours. The kobolds, they get very excited up ahead of you. They are surrounding something covered with vines in the forest. It's some sort of overgrown thing in the clearing, and they're ripping it off. It's like a military style crate. It's like this big wooden crate that's sort of, you've know, got buckles and things like that. It's got a logo of a ram's head on it. And it says in big showy letters, sort of stenciled on, like, that, like you see with spray paint almost, it's called Roscoe Ripper on the front of this crate. The kobolds argue, they fight, they push each other around, and they, they are fighting over who gets to open this treasure. One of them wins, pushes the others away, opens up the lid and looks inside, a blast of fire comes up and out of this crate, like fireworks all going off. As the kobold falls back, his head is missing. He's dead. Fire shooting into the air, a flare of sparks. The sparks explode up above. They fall down like fiery snowflakes all around you. And one of them lands on the kobold next to you. Ah! It's like running around trying to put out the fire that bursts out on its skin. Another one lands nearby. You all decide to run for the only big thick tree that could shelter yourself. So you all run underneath this tree. 
but the fire is falling down on the upper leaves of this tree. This tree is starting to catch on fire, and soon it will dig its way down to you. The fireworks are shooting repeatedly up out of the Roscoe Ripper crate. The trees are on fire. Soon you'll have nowhere to hide. One of you needs to run out and close that crate. So it is time for a hero. Who in your party is the best one to run because they have a dexterity saving throw of plus five? Here's another stat to look at. These are little numbers, a little box. So notice the box. We're not talking about the big ones on the side in a line. We're talking about the little ones in the box. One of you might have a plus five on dexterity over the word saving throws. This is another way in which you can avoid damage. All right. This is how well you overcome things that are done to you, how much you can quickly react to things that are done to you. It's an automatic reaction, basically. And that's where your dexterity save is. Okay, so if you've got, if you're a rogue with the blue sheets, you would have noticed you've got a plus five. Very good. You're the hero. You're nimbler than the others. So hold up that die. You can clear the, take that die out. Hold on to it. Don't roll yet. If you're tied, if you've got all that stuff, of course, you could both roll. If you do not have a rogue with the blue sheet, who has a dexterity of plus three? Yeah? Somebody might have a dexterity plus three. The folk hero fighters, you with the green sheets, okay. Well, you're the best one. You've got a plus three for your saving throw. Raise your die if you're the hero. So we have a hero rolling. Very good. Good. All right, here we go. So you heroes who are ready to go, you run out. You're dodging around. You're falling. All the fire is falling. You're trying to survive. You're trying to get to that crate. All of you are holding up your die. Roll it. This is called a dexterity saving throw. And now add that number for your dexterity save. Oh, here variety. Yep. What's that total? Okay. This is the hardest one yet because you are getting some seriously heroic stuff now. Is your total 14 or higher? 14 or higher. Say what? Yep. So whatever's in your saving throw here, you would add that number to your d20. Yep. So the, you roll the f and whatever's in your dexterity saving throw, that box. And if you're still confused, raise your hand. Your, uh, someone will show it to you. 14 or higher, you are a winner. And if two of you rolled, for whatever reason, and either one got a 14, you're still a winner. Okay, if your party is a winner, here's what happens to you. You run, you dodge, you dodge all the sparks that are going down. You're looking really good. You jump over a burning log. You tuck your legs in a really heroic way. You roll, a rocket fires out, it's heading towards you. You flatten yourself down, it goes over your head. You hit the dirt, you run that last, you roll that last few meters, and then you kick upward and you shut that crate. It's kind of hard to do with manacles, very impressive stuff. And it's closed and you are saved before everybody gets burned. Good job. If your party, uh, oh, uh, yes, is there, is there, I didn't have any loot here. Well, let's see. No, there's no, ah, no, no. So you, because, because the, the tree did not burn down, you notice there's like a gold foil that these things are sort of covered with. So there's gold flakes all around the crate that you quickly scoop up. Now you can share this with your party or you can keep it for yourself, but your party sees you get this. Everybody knows you've scooped up some gold, uh, gold things. All right. So write down in your next, your gold piece thing, write down gold flakes for GP. You can divvy those up and everybody right now can get one gold piece worth of gold flakes or you as the rogue might say, I'll just I'll hold on to this for the party and you can bug them for it later on. It's the rogue's decision whether to give it out or not, to split it up now. Four gold pieces worth of gold foil. That's if you are a winner. If your party did not have a winner, here's what happens to you. Your hero, so this is means you didn't get a 14. Your hero tries, you try as best you can, hero. You dodge, you jump, you try to make it, but a spark falls on you, you scream. It hurts. You know, you, after all, it's like, no, this is, you're, now more things are coming down. You can't do this. You run back to the tree. It's all going wrong. The tree catches on fire. You have to run away from that. You all get burned in the process. So if you are with a hero who did not make that roll, you all uh, lose one hit point by the time the fireworks stop. Everybody loses one hit point. Anybody at zero yet? Anybody newly at zero? Nobody went down to zero? Okay, some of you must be getting a little low. All right. Another chance to shine. Last one's coming up. The march continues. Oh. You enter a burned forest. Now, this is not recently set on fire by Roscoe Ripper. This has been burned for a long time. It's very vast and expansive. 
There's ash on the ground, there's ghosts of burned trees, and the hills is kind of getting gently hilly and sort of you're going slightly downhill as you go. It's a rainstorm breaks out and oh, it smells and burns your eyes. This is like an acidic rainstorm falling all around you. It must be the ash. You all scramble around, it's very unpleasant, and your kobolds and you all find a cobblestone foundation a long lost house. This must be part of that ancient empire that used to be here. Well, thank goodness, because it's floors there and there's a charred trap door in the middle of that foundation. Uh, you go down into what turns out to be a cellar underneath and shut that door. Oh, you take a breath and then you hear the kobolds get very excited. Oh, they're excited again. And you haven't been kobolds around for very long, but you know this is bad news because they have found something they can see in the dark better than you. And when your eyes adjust to the gloom, you can see that there's another chest here. Oh boy, they're excited about this one. This is a chest, but it looks quite fancy. They want to open it. Oh, come on, kobolds. Haven't you learned your lesson? Of course not, they're kobolds. There's no stopping their greed. You're manacled, waiting to see what happens. They are about to open it up real hastily, uh, but one of them, ah, ah, stops. And she pulls out a lock pick. Ah, she like points out, ah, as the other one's like, ah, 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 she's got the lock pick. She creeps up to the chest and very carefully sticks these little needles into the chest, picking the lock, not just breaking it open. There's tension as she fiddles with it, and there's a click. And the box opens up. Ah, sigh of relief. And then bam, 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 bam. The four sides of the chest fall away. And there's a glass box inside this chest. There's a bunch of stuff in the bottom. And there's this buzzing sound. The box fills with bees inside this glass box, rising up from the bottom and swirling around inside it. But there's also like a gleam of metal in there. You, know, you can't really tell what's in there. Bees, oh my goodness. They're banging against the inside of this glass chest and cracks start to appear in the chest. You would get the heck out of here, but that's the last thing that many of you see for a little while because nearly all of you and the kobolds are overwhelmed by sleep. All of a sudden you fall down and everything goes black. Dreamland. We'll sort out in a moment who stays awake. Whoever stays awake sees that on the front of the chest, there's an arcane logic puzzle that you know, wizards tend to be fond of. The idea is that only other very intelligent wizards are allowed to get inside this chest, okay, all right. So I'm gonna show you an example of an easy version of this puzzle. So you read this, the top, you read row by row, left to right. So the top row, you've got a box in the upper left corner. The next one over, there's a box in the upper middle. And the next one, there's a box in the upper right. There's a pattern there. Oh, okay, there's another example. The second row is another example of the same kind of pattern. Box to the left, box to the middle, box to the right. In the bottom, you've got a box to the lower left, a box in the middle. So the last box, according to the same pattern, is which of these letters? A. A, right? A has got the box in the lower right because it follows the same rule as the top two rows, all right? Okay, that's, that's an easy one, all right. So here's another example. All right, so take a look at this one. Anybody got it yet? Yeah. Okay, don't, don't say the answer yet. Give me another few seconds. Because when it comes time, this will be a timed challenge when I do the last one. All right, so the rule is this little black box is sort of moving left to right through that grid, right? So you see that, uh, that example says so like the block is sort of sliding along the line, right? So the answer is F, right? So the block moves from one end of the line to the other. Now the second row, the line is tilted, but it's, the block slides from one end to the other. Bottom one, the, the stick is tilted, but the same general rule. It's sliding from one end to the other. So the block is slid to the bottom of that little box. That's the one that is marked with F. That's the correct answer. So it's time for a hero of a yet another sort. Now, first of all, who in your party is awake to see this? Who is an elf? All right. Let's see the top of that sheet. Well, I don't have a mark here, but high intelligence as well, right? If you're an elf, at the very top of your sheet, it says what your race is. Again, it's like a species. You're a humanoid, but you all, you know, sort of have different sort of branches of heritage. An elf is a certain type of person. You wizards with the purple sheet, you are, a, you're an elven. You're the hero because elves are immune to magical sleep. One of those handy elf things. All right, so if that's you, hold up your sheet and get a pencil ready. You're going to write down an answer. 
Now, if there is somebody, a party that does not have an elf, okay, that's, that's too bad, because an elf would really be handy here. Who has the highest intelligence bonus in the party? So I have it marked up here on there. So the elf, the elf wizards are smart, they have a plus three. I don't know if anybody's a plus two. Does somebody even have a plus one in intelligence? Ah, the rogue. You rogues, if you have no elf in your party, rogues with blue sheets, you know, you got your street smart, you know. You got some intelligence compared to the average. Now remember, a zero intelligence does not mean you're dumb. It means you're average, right? So that's fine. Don't, don't feel too bad if you got a zero intelligence. Yours average. So you rogues with that one, you stay awake, but you barely stay awake. So you got a bit of disadvantage coming up. But hold up your sheet, get your pencil ready. If you're a rogue and don't have a wizard in your party, it's the rogue that's going to solve this one. All right. So you either have rogues or wizards, and you're ready to write things down. Uh, get the space on your sheet, ready to write down an answer. Now, everyone, except the elven wizards, you're asleep, so close your eyes. Close your eyes, for real, close them. Everyone except the elven wizards. Rogues, close your eyes too, because you are you initially fall asleep. Only the elven wizards should have their eyes open right now. Now reach into your partner's wallet, no. Uh, <laughs> okay, so wizards, your eyes are open, everybody else is closed. Elves, you did not fall asleep, yeah? So you are looking at this glass box full of bees. The buzzing is getting louder. Maybe the rest of you who are asleep are having a terrible dream about this noise. It's rattling, it's cracking, it's going to break soon. You look at the front of this chest, you see this puzzle. You need to push one of the tiles that picks the right answer. Elves only, here is the puzzle. Write the letter of the correct answer on your sheet. Rogues, open your eyes because you fought off your sleep. Rogues can open your eyes and now you've got a few more seconds to solve it. Elves and rogues are both looking at now. Bzzz, the bus is, box is buzzing. It's cracking. It's cracking. Three, two, one. Pencils down. Put your pencils down. The answer is D. The answer is D. This is the hardest one. It's like the box moves around the plus, but the dot stays in the same place. So you see in the first row, the dot is staying there, but the box is moving kind of clockwise. The next one, the dot stays in the same place, the box moves clockwise. The third one, the box is moving clockwise, the dot has stayed there. So you know that you've got D, where you've got the thing down there in the, in the lower right corner, and that box is moved clockwise to the next space, that's D. That's the correct answer. If you wrote down D, you are a winner and you are going to save the party from some trouble. If your party has a winner, here is what happens to you. All right, puzzle solver. You furrow your brow. You look at the puzzle. Everyone else is asleep. The buzzing gets very loud. The glass is cracking. A few seconds left. You push that D. You push that correct tile. The bees all fall to the bottom. They fall asleep. Everyone else oh, starts to stir and they start to wake up but they're not awake yet. The top of the glass box opens, and inside that box is treasure, ancient gold medallions. If you are a winner, write your treasure on your sheet only, a three next to the GP for gold pieces. Now you pocket this, or definitely, yeah, you, you, you pocket this for at first because everyone is still asleep, especially the kobolds, before anyone is awake. Are you going to give that later to the others? In this case, it's a bit of role playing. Now you as players know that the wizards have this, but I invite you to role play your character as if your character doesn't know. We don't often do this because personally it's a bit of PVP. I don't like the team to sort of be broken up, but yeah, I want to show you the other side. Some DMs love to do this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, th this is something that you can choose as the wizard to cop to it now, cop to it later. If you cop to it now, you know the kobolds are going to take it away. So, you know, will you remember to do it later on? Because you other characters, it would be out of character for you to remind the wizard of that treasure. You have that treasure. It's up to you, wizards, to decide to share it. If you do not have a winner, you do the best you can, you know, but you picked the wrong trial or you just can't decide in time. The crate shatters. The bees fly out. They sting everyone. Everyone in the party takes one hit point of damage. But the kobolds do too. <laughs> Doesn't kill any, unfortunately. Oh, okay, it killed one. Yes, it killed one of the kobolds because they were burned by the fire. But at least it woke you up. All right, you all, because the bees, you run up out of that cellar, out of the bee swarm, you shut the trap door, and there's no, you never find out that the treasure was there to begin with. 
Anybody at zero now? Oh, too bad. You had a shit day. Oh, yeah. Sturges, the fire. Do you blame anybody in particular? I won't put you on the spot. That's okay. But remember, <laughs> as you were unconscious, you saw the gods, right? So write that down in your sheet. Say, died, saw gods. You can remind the DM of that later on. That could be useful. The kobolds, they stabilize you. They do something as uh, they stuff herbs into your mouth, but it's barely as good as a good berry. Uh, you get up to two hit points. So if you were at zero, now you've got two. Because they want you alive. All right. Nat, Nat was very clear on that. It is almost dawn when you work your way into uh, a canyon. The burned forest drops away in front of you. The, you can tell by the chatter of the kobolds you finally reached your destination. A jagged canyon is here. It opens at your feet and it extends off to the east. Every time I gesture like this, this way is north. It's like we're in a hollow deck, and I can see it. Hopefully, you can too. That way is where the, we're sort of facing this way to the south. As going off to the east, that way is the is the jagged canyon. It goes straight east, and off to the east, the ground is gets weirder and weirder. It gets kind of like weird and warped and sort of humpy and weird looking off to the east side. Not like hills, stretched up and down. Not natural. You're at the edge of the canyon. You're looking down. You see caves in all the walls all around you. And there's many different monsters everywhere in this canyon. The kobolds push you to hide in the bushes uh, around the edge. And you look at these monsters. You see a marching row of goblins. Oh, I don't have a picture of the goblins, but they're small and stocky, but they're much more like soldier-like. And they are numerous. They've got spears. They've got banners. And they're kind of marching in a military sense uh, and, and uh, behind a big sort of tall goblin types with banners. And they're headed north. Oh, you heard that the farm towns are being raided by goblins that came from the south. Maybe there's something to this. Maybe this is, nobody knows where these goblins have been coming from. They've just been fighting them off way off to the north. They seem to be coming from this place. They're coming out of caves and marching. You're on to something. You see orcs. Orcs are huge. They're bigger than you. They've got tusks for goodness sake. They have no weapons though. They don't really have armor. They're sort of wrapped up in loincloths and things. They're down on a flat part of the canyon. And there's two different groups. Like one has like red loincloths, and the other one's blue lo loincloths. And they're like running at each other and kind of pushing at each other. And there's, you know, wrestling. And one of them is carrying like a big stuffed pig. Like, what the fuck? Okay, anyway, you sort of hide again. The kobolds want you to go down, down into that canyon. You go down this sort of steep hill. You dodge and duck, you know, through the bushes. You reach a cave, the kobolds cave at the bottom of the canyon. Many more kobolds come out of that cave. These are new looking. Their skin is kind of splotchy brownish gray. Your captors, you realize by contrast, they have very light gray skin with sort of white, almost snowy kind of pattern patches on the top parts of their bodies. So they seem to be kind of, you know, sort of different groups. The splotchy ones from the cave, after talking, they give bags of jingling coins to the snowy kobolds that have been your captors all this time. The snowy kobolds, they march north with their newfound coins, leaving you behind. The splotchy kobolds, they put bags over your heads. And with a click, you've got like an iron ring around your head with a tough canvas bag you now cannot see. You are jostled and poked by this new group of kobolds, and now you're inside the cave. You can't see, but it smells terrible. It's crowded. There's, it twists and turns. On your left side, there's an opening, because you can tell by sort of the echoing in there, and there's this kachunga, 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 like the sound of machinery. Uh, busy, hard clashes machinery off to the left. You hear a scream by a human voice. I see it! I, I see the shard! Behind the rocks! I'll get it! I'll get the shard! And then you hear the sounds of metal tearing and breaking through rock through those screams but you are pushed and prodded, and that falls behind you, echoing behind you. You're all shoved together into some sort of small space. You stumble forward. There's like a clang behind you. You turn around, you, f you f touch bricks on one side. You touch iron bars on the other side. You feel all around. The cobalt chatter is getting further and further away. You realize that you must be in a prison cell with no escape, but you can still hear that screaming off in the distance behind you. And that, is where we're going to stop for now. Hopefully you're keen to see what happens next, I hope. Yeah? yeah? Good time, all right. All right, good, good. So, if you... I hope you enjoyed watching us teach Dungeons & Dragons to absolute beginners. Want to know more about how we do it? Then support our nonprofit mission. 
unlock extensive how-to videos, and use the Courage and Chaos method yourself by using free materials that we provide. You can get all that at the link that you see here. That is tinyearl.com slash teachdd, or you can click that link in the description. Of course, please like, share, and subscribe. We're going to come out with these videos every two weeks in this series, so I will see you again soon.